Putin's recent press conference, he was talking about Odessa. He said that Odessa is a Russian city. It's a huge change in his view. The United States could have saved Odessa for Ukraine if they were going to negotiate with Russia before. How do you see the situation right now in Ukraine? Is there any will in the Biden administration to go after negotiations? No. In, in 2010, 2011, 2013, Russia's demands vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine were that Ukraine should be neutral. That's all. Uh, and Russia negotiated with the government of Ukraine a lease to the year 2042 for Sevastopol naval base. There were no demands for annexation. There were no demands for territory. There was no claim on Crimea. There was simply a pragmatic approach. Don't join the U.S. military alliance and our military base, our naval base, which has been uh, in Sevastopol, Crimea, since 1783, should remain there. And we want a long term lease for that, which President Yanukovych negotiated. That's all the demands. Then the United States uh, overthrew or was party to the overthrow of Yanukovych. <laughs> Russia took back Crimea. Even then, there were no demands for the eastern Ukrainian uh, regions, that is the Donbas. Uh, what Russia said was stop killing ethnic Russians, give autonomy to ethnic Russians. And that became the basis for the so-called Minsk I and Minsk II agreements. The Minsk II agreement did not call for independence of the Donbas or that Russia would annex the Donbass. It just said autonomy. And it was a position backed up unanimously by the UN Security Council. Uh, but the United States said, no, nah, we don't care. Uh, I told Ukraine, you don't have to implement that. Uh, and so that was lost. Even as late as December 2021, Putin was not making demands for territory. He was calling for the Minsk agreements to be enforced, claiming Crimea and demanding that NATO stop enlarging. Well, the United States government is deaf to the uh, interests of any other place in the world. Uh, they're so arrogant that the position is we don't have to listen to anything. And so when President Putin put a draft security agreement on the table based on those premises that NATO would not enlarge, uh, that the Minsk uh, agreement would be honored finally years after it was supposed to go into effect. Biden said, nah, we don't have to negotiate. Russia launched its special military invasion in March uh, 2022, and by then, the Duma, the Russian uh, parliament, had uh, recognized eastern Ukraine as independent. Uh, Lugansk and Donetsk as independent. Did not annex them. That came in September 2022. But in March, it recognized their independence. But Russia demanded Ukrainian neutrality and said on that basis there could be immediate peace. And Ukraine and Russia famously were close to an agreement on ending the war weeks after it had started, weeks. And the United States said no. And Britain said no. We will not support you. You fight on. Hundreds of thousands of people, Ukrainian young men, have died since then. So this is about American foreign policy. And it's so, so sad. It is not just demands for territory by Russia. It is the fact that Russian demands keep rising in the context of continuing rejections from the United States. Definitely, the rhetoric has turned even more aggressive. But the White House is so stupid, sorry, in the US, they don't understand anything 
But what they certainly don't understand is that Biden should call Putin and say, we've got to stop this. We don't want to see all of Ukraine destroyed. But you're right. We should never have tried to expand NATO. That was really stupid. And you told us that since 2007. That's the call that's needed. But I don't think Biden's up to it. And certainly his neocon team opposes that very premise. Fight on. Uh, basically kidnap young people off the streets uh, of uh, Ukrainian cities and throw them to the front line where they're dying uh, by the hundreds, sometimes thousand or more per day. That's the policy. In Europe, we are seeing that new leaders that are coming to power in Netherlands, in Slovakia, we had Orban. They are against this war in Ukraine, against sending more aids, more weapons to Ukraine. How influential would that be on the U.S. foreign policy in Ukraine? It's having an effect, obviously. Uh, um, Orban by himself uh, blocked the formal approval of the next round of uh, European assistance. Uh, FICO in uh, Slovakia will be joining that cause. The government in uh, the Netherlands is still being negotiated. But the party that came out number one, as you said, Wilders, uh, is against further aid. Uh, of course, the new Polish government is probably is pretty gung ho for uh, more uh, financial and military support to Ukraine. Things are dragging out, uh, but most of Europe uh, does their best to follow blindly the United States. This is really tragic, uh, though all of these uh, cracks uh, in the foundation are, are clearly appearing. What's stunning is if you look up approval rating of world leaders and one of the websites that uh, reports weekly opinion polling, there's not a European leader that has a net positive approval rating. Most of them are incredibly unpopular. Uh, Schultz, uh, 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 Janos Garstori in, uh, in Norway, uh, uh, Macron, hugely unpopular. Uh, they're promoting war is not winning public support. There's no one in Europe that has a net positive approval rating in this group of NATO boosters, not even close. And the ratings keep going down and down. Look what's happening to Schultz in Germany. It's a collapse of public support. And in the United States, Biden does not have public support for his foreign policy. We know that Austria are trying to block the new package of sanctions on Russia. Is that possible that Austria can make some middle ground for both sides? I think that uh, more and more politicians in Europe are understanding this is wrong. It was a terrible mistake. It's not working. Uh, they generally are so beholden to the United States or for one reason or another afraid of it or bought off that they don't say in public what they often say in private. But there are more European politicians uh, coming to the fore, definitely saying we've got to stop this. Uh, and um, that will have uh, an effect, not from one day to the next, but it's definitely coming. Similarly, in the United States, uh, public opinion is, is, is gone for this. Uh, Congress, which uh, listens to the military industrial complex, uh, is in angst because they want to vote more money for weapons. Uh, the Democrats want to support Biden, but it's completely wrongheaded uh, to be sending tens of billions of dollars more without even an attempt at negotiations. So I think that this is uh, a failing policy that will come to an end, it has to, and it doesn't have to, but it's very likely to in 2024, but it's agonizingly slow. And what is so frustrating is the absence of uh, many voices of sanity. Viktor Orban in Hungary is one of them. Fico is a voice of sanity. There are very few right now.
as you mentioned, the U.S. foreign policy is so important. What's happening to the Democratic Party? We know that Cornel West, Jill Stein, even Bobby Kennedy, they're not welcome in the Democratic Party. They have to find their <laughs> their way of fighting in the new election. What the Democratic Party is losing for the next election? How do you see their situation? Well, I'll give you a personal answer. They lost my vote. I used to be a Democrat. I used to vote uh, Democratic uh, basically uh, all my life. And uh, I have left the party. Uh, and I put it in personal terms because I think I reflect a view that is uh, quite widespread. The Democratic Party for me is unrecognizable right now. Uh, when I joined the Democrats, I joined uh, originally in, in the 1960s uh, as I was still in high school, so I was a, a, a kid. But the idea was it was uh, at least the part of our political system that was against the Vietnam War. And there was always a uh, strong uh, leftist part of the Democratic Party that was anti-war. And that was what I felt was my home. Now there isn't any anti-war part of the Democratic Party at all. Uh, not in the Congressional Democratic Party, not in the White House. You don't find other than a very, very few people uh, any voice for this right now. All the mainstream voices are more war, more funding. Uh, the uh, Senate Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer was at school same time I was at, at Harvard. Uh, I've known him for many, many decades. Uh, what's his role right now? Well, keep the Senate uh, uh, in session so that we can uh, still send more money to Ukraine. It's terrible. There's no thinking anymore. It's incredibly ignorant. Uh, and this is across the Democratic Party. So it's, uh, it's, it's really quite, uh, quite upsetting. Is the political arena of the United States ready to have a third party, even fourth party? We have Bobby Kennedy, who was not welcome in the Democratic Party. I don't know what they're thinking of, but he has a very good chance of getting more votes from the Democratic Party. We have Cornel West and Jill Stein. Those are so important candidates to make some equilibrium within the Democratic Party. I think the mainstream Democrats uh, are, uh, <laughs> are are extremely confused and befuddled and the wrong message, uh, and they've lost their way. And Biden is, uh, is a terrible candidate and has been basically a warmonger during this whole period. So it's a, it, it is a position that is outside of American public opinion right now. Uh, they've opened the door more for Trump than just about any anything else. I sensed it from the beginning that strangely, because it's a principle of American politics that foreign policy is not decisive. I said, you're going to go down on the foreign policy, which is really something. Uh, it was so bad, so misconceived. I wrote a, a few articles about that, that uh, this makes no sense, even politically, much less geopolitically, if I could put it that way. It makes no sense in terms of domestic politics. And this is how things are playing out right now. The American public rejects uh, Biden's foreign policy. Uh, he is not going to win re-election, most likely, and not certainly not on this approach. And I want you to specifically comment on Cornel West and Jill Stein. Because oh, you know, they're, they're fine people. They're not going to be president, most likely. They're fine people. Bobby Kennedy has a much larger following and a much larger position in, in the polls. And we'll see what the dynamics are now. Uh, so uh, th there are, I mean, Cornell West is a wonderful person. I've been friendly uh, with him for decades. Uh, I don't know Jill Stein personally, but um, it's it's Bobby Kennedy that has the, the name, the, the uh, uh, public recognition, uh, the position in the opinion polls. And he certainly has a, an open chance. I, I, I urge him all the time, be the candidate of peace. You'll win if you're the candidate of peace. 
This is uh, really important. This is what the American people want. Is it possible for him to convince Cornel West or even Jill Stein to, to, to be part of his campaign? Well, I think right now, uh, you know, they're each going to do their thing. They're each going to run. Uh, we're, we're still uh, almost a year away from the election. So a lot can happen between now and next November. And, and we'll see. But for the moment, they're going to campaign. Uh, and uh, right now, Bobby Kennedy shows up in the opinion surveys, typically uh, between 10 and 20 percent uh, of support. That's a lot for a third party candidate. And we're early, early days because uh, most Americans are not really focused on the elections. This is still very much a, a, a professional politician thing at this point. And it will only start to heat up uh, at the beginning of next year with primaries and caucuses. And then we'll see how things evolve. Just before wrapping up this session, I want to know your opinion on this U.S. economic war on China. How is it going with these two conflicts in Ukraine and in Israel? We know that China is doing, they're doing their way, they're, they're growing. And how do you see right now in the U.S.? Are they focused on the economy? Are they focused on these wars? How are these wars going to benefit the economy? It is uh, pretty much uh, taken for granted among the mainstream of both the Democratic and the Republican parties, I have to say, that China is an enemy. Uh, and uh, the rhetoric vis-a-vis -vis China is extremely stupid, low-level, ignorant, uh, and dangerous. Uh, and this is both parties, uh, because even uh, uh, parts of the Republican Party that are not interested in the Ukraine war want to stop the funding to a significant extent, say, yes, because we need the resources to fight China. And so there's a kind of comic book feeling to it that, oh, there could be a war with China. That would just be fine and dandy. Uh, of course, it could end the world. It's so reckless and dangerous the way that our politicians talk, the way the mainstream media uh, report things, uh, say, yeah, coming war with China as if that's uh, you know, a, a normal kind of statement as opposed to something absolutely horrifying. Uh, and the rhetoric about uh, Taiwan, as if Taiwan is uh, the 51st American state, uh, as if the United States doesn't have a, a one China diplomatic policy, which they seem to forget. Uh, it's all quite dangerous. Uh, the US, starting with Trump, actually starting with Obama in, political ways, starting with Trump in trade policies and now with Biden in trade policies, finance policies, technology policies, is really leaning hard against China. Uh, it's doing some damage uh, to Chinese uh, uh, macroeconomics in the short term because it's really uh, stopped the growth of China's exports to the U.S. market and Europe has broadly gone along with this. Uh, and so that is hurting a bit, but I think China has ways around that, including expanding its role in the non-US, non-EU world. And I expect that that to happen. China's underlying strengths for growth are very strong. It's a, a high saving uh, society with excellent education uh, and a very strong research, development, uh, and uh, enterprises uh, that are at the cutting edge of many technologies, whether it's electric vehicles or renewable energy or uh, advanced computation. China has great, great depth and strength. So this is not a fly-by-night uh, economy. This is a very, very serious and sophisticated economy with a lot of geopolitical support. Uh, and uh, I don't think the United States can, quote, contain China. It's a terrible idea, uh, an absurd idea, a dangerous idea, and I don't think uh, possibly a successful idea.